Welcome back, everyone, to Open Line. Talking with Dr. Carol Busey, that's Davidson County's historian, about uh, about gentrification, its impact on historic buildings in Nashville. And, and I love basically talking to you. You get to hear stories about our city and our county. You're talking about this Grundy Place, which is gone. It's gone. But what happened to Grundy Place? Well, James K. Polk and Mrs. Polk, Sarah Childers Polk, bought the house. He died before they moved in after his presidency. So she lived in that house for another 40 plus years. She lived a very long life. She had no children. In her later years, a niece lived in the house with her. But because she was the widow of a president of the United States, even though her nephews were fighting for the Confederacy. The Polks owned a plantation down in Mississippi that was, the labor force were enslaved workers there. She, the Union generals came and paid a courtesy call on Mrs. Polk. Ulysses S. Grant uh, went and made a courtesy call and presidents when they were in town went and made a courtesy call on Mrs. Polk. Rutherford B. Hayes came here in 1877 to lay the corner stone at the customs house and he went and visited Mrs. Polk but her whole reason for living in many ways was to protect her husband's memory when he he was buried in the front lawn William Strickland <laughs> he was buried in the front lawn the front lawn so, of wow. the house okay. uh, and you'll see you see the the monument there on on the, on the right hand side of your screen that is where the president was buried and that is a William Strickland design marker her. But uh, she died. She had written her will and she made it very clear that she wanted her niece to be able to stay in that house and she wanted it turned into a house museum. Well, her nephews broke the will and they sold the property and the house was torn down. Now there we've got the president, a former president of the United States, buried in the front yard, and she presumably was buried right there beside him. So the legislature came to the rescue, and they were removed from there along with their monument and brought to the east northeastern corner of the property where the state capitol is so president and mrs polk may not be resting completely in peace but they are resting uh, at, at the state capitol on the state capitol grounds wow okay and that is again for reference right where the sheraton right across from legislative plaza right across from the legislature the sheraton right. hotel very interesting okay let's go to another one rokeby mansion um and we have a picture Let's hear the story of this. Where Where is this and, and what happened? Uh, where is this? This is uh, no longer in existence. It was the home of uh, Oliver Bliss and his family. Uh, he was a lawyer in town. He was also a very religious man and highly educated. And after he had made a lot of money as a lawyer, he uh, became ordained as a Presbyterian minister, although I don't think he ever had his own church. This is on Grand Avenue over there between sort of Vanderbilt and Skerritt, if you will, there. It, it's now, this, this property was ultimately sold to the Methodist denomination and they tore it down and put a building there. But the thing that's interesting about this house is that one of Bliss's children was Adelicia Hayes, who first married Isaac Franklin, arguably one of the nation's largest sale, slave traders in the country who made a fortune and he had built the Fairview mansion on his plantation in Sumner County but she she grew up in this house and so it has a lot of connections to the Belmont mansion which was her house in town so to speak and so this is a very interesting house it it was a spacious house there were lawyers and dignitaries and judges in and out of this house quite regularly Regularly. And it was a beautiful place and probably in pretty good condition, but it too came down when uh, progress, it was seen as progress to take 
older buildings out of particularly buildings that were built before electricity that had to be wired this was a huge challenge to put these in and then you know they were also built before indoor plumbing so you had to put plumbing in and and it, it was going to be such an expensive proposition to save this house and that that financial incentive is always there when people think about renovating they think oh we'd be better off just to just tearing it down tear it down wow all right that's great that's great so that's Rokeby mansion what about the next one here burlington mansion burlington mansion was on elliston place elliston place was named for joseph Elliston. He was like so many people who came to Nashville early. He came without any money. He had nothing. But he found a trade that made him actually quite prosperous. He became a silversmith. And people, as their status in life uh, developed, and Nashville becomes such a prosperous trading town because of the steamboats coming up the Cumberland River and there's a lot of trade and business going on and banking going on that he makes a good bit of money so he builds this on a piece of property out at the edge of the city really outside the city in a way because the gulch was more or less the geographic boundary of the city for a good long while this is a place on Elliston place I think there is now a Hampton Inn on this property it was <laughs> there it is was, a Hampton Inn there there is a Hampton yeah. Inn, but it doesn't look anything like this. No. But before the Hampton Inn, the Catholic Diocese had built bought that property and built Father Ryan High School, which it was then torn down for uh, the building of this Hampton Hampton Inn. And so that property was there, and he owned a good bit of property all the way to Murphy Road. And so some of his uh, children had some property along in there too. But this was a very very fine house and it was destroyed it was it was torn down father ryan went there after the house yeah the, the, the house went and then they moved out to the franklin road area right okay let's go to joyce who's on the line here hello joyce good evening i just wanted to thank you for having Ms. Dr. Busey on. She is a national treasure, that's for sure. Um, one thing I had heard was that uh, some of the uh, lighter destruction of Nashville could be credited to Mrs. Pope because of her entertaining those uh, northern generals who called upon her and maybe we weren't burned like Atlanta was, for instance. And then just a, a general question, what can we ordinary citizens do to help protect some of these properties that are becoming more and more endangered? Well, great, great questions. Okay, I love the first question. Okay. Is that true about us not being burned because these generals that, came and... That really is not... That's a, a legend. There are many legends here, and that one is unfortunately one of the many that is not true. The reason that the city was not burned was because Nashville fell very early in the Civil War. February 1862, there was not a single shot fired. There was no battle whatsoever in February of 1862. After Fort Donelson fell up on the western side of Clarksville, the Confederate powers that be, General Johnston and our Confederate governor, governor Isham G. Harris, did not think the city of Nashville could be defended. The Confederates did not have enough forces to protect Nashville. So Governor Harris and the entire General Assembly quickly left town and went west to Memphis. The bankers quickly took the money and whatever in the bank vaults and went to Murfreesboro or farther, further south and the city was left to be surrendered by the mayor of the city. So Nashville was the first Confederate capital to fall to the Union Army. It was of great importance to Abraham Lincoln that this city be held for the remainder of the war. 
For that reason, Nashville, Tennessee was probably one of the most heavily fortified cities in the country. It was behind Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, New Orleans, and Nashville, because it was in the middle of this whole region where the Union Army wanted to come through and go down into the heart of the Confederacy in Alabama and Mississippi. So as a result, result of this, the Union generals here were told to treat the citizens with all respect. And if the men were willing to take an oath of allegiance to the Union Army, they did not have to go to prison. They could go back to doing whatever they had been doing before the war. Business could be conducted as usual. And to make sure that those young Union soldiers did not mess with our beautiful Southern Nashville women, the Union Army even legalized prostitution here in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and so the city was really about the safest place you could be during the Civil War in the South. If you got out as far as the Belmead Plantation or Murfreesboro or any of these surrounding areas, that was sort of no man's land where you were in danger of your cows being stolen, various things happening, but you were safe here. For the rest of the Civil War, from February 1862 until the a Battle of Nashville, which takes place in December 1864, just four or five months before the war ended, the Confederate Army of Tennessee tried over and over to retake, to liberate Nashville. They tried it from Shiloh. It didn't work. They tried it from Kentucky. They tried it from Murfreesboro. They tried and tried, and finally, after the fall of Atlanta, the Confederate General John Bell Hood came up with this great ambitious plan to come up and, and retake Nashville from the south and that's when the Battle of Franklin took place in late November and the Battle of Nashville in mid-December. Wow. It remained held and it was safe. Atlanta fell because there was a huge battle and the city was burned by the victors, the Union Army. Wow. That's all right, that's all so interesting. I've heard some of that, but much of that I've not heard. I like Joyce's thought that it was saved because the generals paid visit to Miss Polk. That's that's a nice thought. But the it's facts a good, are it's different. a good idea. But yeah, the that's facts an interesting legend. The facts are different. All right, Joyce, thanks for that. We'll come back and I'll ask you what can what can normal people do? What okay, can average people do to, to save that. you know to save some of these historic buildings? Take a break, be back right after this.